Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Art of Transformation podcast. I'm your host, Mark Sheff, and today we've got a wonderful expert in the world of transformation, in the world of business. Ben DePaz is a cross-cultural leadership and performance coach. His company, Big Coaching, works with startups to medium-sized uh, businesses. He works a lot with C-level, C-suite kind of people, and he works specifically on leadership, purpose, and emotional intelligence. He's got uh, a background in NLP, hypnotherapy, a number of other things, and he's worked kind of all over the world, and he delivers big workshops, and he does a lot of this work, and his goal is to empower others to achieve their fullest potential with authenticity, authenticity, gratitude, and purpose. So without further ado, I'd love to get the conversation started, and I'll see you on the other side with Ben. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. Um, ben, wonderful to have you here. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, Mark. Thanks for having me here. And you are if I recall, you're in Paris, you're in France. I'm in Bordeaux. So yeah, in ah. France, Southwest wine, Southwest wine country. Oh, amazing. Amazing. Great wine out there. Um, I've been to Paris a few times. I haven't been much to the countryside. How do you like it out there? It's a pretty relaxed life. Of course, <laughs> you can find your stresses uh, everywhere, but uh, it's lovely. The, the weather is generally pretty amazing. After 10 years in the UK, it's quite nice. Yeah. And, uh, Everybody's chilling here. There's not much coaching going on because everybody's just enjoying life. I, I was sort of curious about that, right? Because um, I know that you work with uh, typically, uh, not not solely, but a lot of you know corporate clients. So how does that work when you're you know not necessarily in the middle of the hustle and bustle of like a Paris or New York or London? So that's something I did want to ask about. Was you know now that we can kind of do things anywhere, you know, it means that we can live in Bordeaux or just sort of, yeah. you know, the middle of, of, of not a big city. But how does that work when you're, you know, when you're out there looking for clients, when you're trying to find, you know, clients and you're not in a, a big city like Paris or London? Yeah, well, great question. I mean, historically, I invested a lot of time in places where my clients were at. So I lived five years in London, lived f four years in a other city than London, but traveled every week. So I had a lot of in-person presence. However, even during that time, I did build clients in New York where I was never going to. So mm. I think for me, my clientele has always been working word of mouth. And therefore, mm -hmm. these networks that were London-based had often connections, friends or business colleagues in like the New York office. And so after some time working with them, I would be introduced and the whole relationship would occur online yeah i do so nowadays i'd say that after these 10 years nowadays i kind of continue this snowball even if i'm at a distance it doesn't matter the, the word of mouth can continue however i do make the effort to travel so i go to london once a month for example i try to go to new york once or twice a year because seeing people in person at least once kind of does make a difference so i, I feed it through still going in person but i don't need I don't really need to. And how does that work? I know you have, Is how old is your, your new addition, your new baby? Uh, daughter, she, she's uh, seven and a half months old. Well, you know, I, I guess it hasn't changed that much. I mean, it has changed because I want to travel way less than I, mm. did, than I did before. But um, traveling once a month for three days, for example, is, is not an issue. Well, I, I'm also blessed that my partner is really loving looking after her and... Um, we do have some community support. My parents now are not far. So yeah. there's obviously systems to help with that. But I think it's the first trip or two were painful because I didn't want to <laughs> I didn't want to leave. But then, you know, you get used to it. And I'm very clear about the boundaries of that and how I, I don't want to go away for like 10 days or any long prolonged period of time but as a personal choice. But yeah, in itself, it's not very difficult to keep a small amount of traveling going. Absolutely. I, I, I've been watching a lot of, um, there's a couple of sort of parents that I follow on you know, TikTok and, and Instagram. And, you know, the thing, the thing that I keep seeing over and over again is, you know, people saying, Oh, what do you do for fun? You know, and, and more and more and more, what I do for fun is just be by myself in a room that locks that no one can come in. So, you know, that, that three day trip is kind of great because no one's going to ask you to like, you know, get the milk or go to the grocery store or move the car or any of that other stuff. It's kind of a nice little respite. And actually, vice, my wife travels a lot. And it's kind of nice just to sort of have the run of the house a as well. Um, obviously, nice to have you know people around as well. But word of mouth, I'm curious, you know, uh, the people who listen to this are, are probably, you know, at least, you know, in the coaching world or uh, a lot of creatives. 
And the idea of building a word of mouth business is really appealing, but obviously, you know, you don't just hang a shingle on the internet and suddenly people are referring you. Like how, how would you recommend somebody start a business like that? Well, I've been lucky enough to follow a similar kind of content as, as uh, where you and I met um, with Rich, Rich Lidvin's work and Steve Chandler's work. Obviously, I'm mm -hmm. speaking here about coaching because I, I don't know about other professions, although I, my sense is that it would work in a similar way. Um, if I have to summarize, I would say that it's it's going to sound a bit cliche what I say, but it's really relationships, building long-term view, um, and making sure that your service is actually impactful like actually mm -hmm. makes a difference. And then of course you can learn a lot of little pieces of languages and little systems that can help you create engineer, let's say more referrals organically mm -hmm. by helping your first clients, for example, think of you when one of their <laughs> friends is going through something similar uh, or something that you could help with. There's a, there's a way to help your people advocate for you a bit more proactively or a bit more consciously because otherwise you just don't come to mind. So if you just leave it hoping that people will just refer people to you, not much is going to happen or maybe a bit, but not enough to build a business. I think following the prosperous coach approach and, and other systems of that very same philosophy, but actually really implementing a lot of the advice and systems I've learned over time, it builds up. It's not a, it's not a one year thing, mm. but, but the snowball does occur. The network grows and over time I now have enough that a lot of it is self-sustaining. Now, when I say this, I'm constantly rechecking with people, like reconnecting with old clients, just offering them time to hang out, hang out, you could say, because some of them are also friends uh, now. Mm. And you just keep it alive by constantly focusing more on the relationship than trying to sell something. And that's really what I've done for years. And it sounds very simple, but it really does work if your service is good. Yeah. You're re reaching out to old clients and, and reconnecting or just you know, <laughs> reminding them that you exist. Yeah, you know, it's it's hard. It's hard because, and, and this took me a while, honestly. I, and I've, you know, I've been in the sort of solopreneur business for a long time, and you know, only now am I really starting to build real systems where you know, simple things like you know, after I talk to someone, setting a reminder in you know a month to to reach out, to send them an email, yeah. to. to you know, one of the things that I read in, in Steve Chandler's book, the um, the the wonderfully titled "How to Get Clients," um, it's a it's a it's a quick read. You know, I read it in kind of an afternoon. It's like a two hundred page book, but it's you know yeah. it's big print, um, very short chapters. And, oh, there it is. Yeah, All right, well done. But you, have you read it, or are you about to read it? Yeah. One, one of the things that is sort of you know people are like, "What's the book about?" You know, and I'm like, "Well, it's about how to get clients." But half the book is about referrals. Yeah. Half the book is about how important referrals are. And one tidbit that really stood out to me that I feel like I should have known, but kind of clicked in when I read it, uh, you know, in his book was that you have to nurture the the same way that you nurture people to sort of create the client relationship or, or a potential client relationship, you nurture the referral. So, yeah. you know, someone, you know, and he says it really well in the book, you know, if I refer somebody to you, and you say, thank you, that's great. And then if I never hear again, and I have another referral, well, I'm probably not going to refer them to you because I have no idea how that went. Yeah, right. So, so now, you know, when when I get referrals, and you know, if somebody ends up signing on, or even if they don't, at each meeting, I'll remember that's my trigger to, to write back to the person and say, Oh, by the way, I met with your person, I wanted to thank you again. And if they sign up, I certainly, you know, send them like a nice little gift or, or offer them a free session, that kind of thing. Is there mm -hmm. is there a, a standard procedure you have for for nurturing referrals? I think exactly what you said, I might even keep them a little bit more in the loop at first through voice notes most of the time, right? But it could be if I'm on a quick call with them, I'll, I'll add, oh, by the way, thank you for referring me to Susie, like, um, we've had a great conversation so far, there's a few things she's she's going to do. And then maybe we'll talk again. But already um it was really great to connect with her and she really enjoyed our time together and so i wanted to thank you for this so like you said just a little message like this regardless of what happens and then when there's more clarity around what happens of course i will have another message and sometimes with clients i've worked with for six months or or, or more a year or so on after a few months of working together especially when cool stuff happens which tends to happen uh, <laughs> i will send a voice note again to um, the initial person who referred us by saying just literally that I'm having a great time working with their friend. And so I'm really grateful because, you know, a lot is happening in their life. That's great. And that's thanks to them for having introduced us. Yeah. And even sometimes I will, when something really cool happens and they, for example, a client thanks me, which does 
happen. I'm, I'm not sending myself flowers, but you know, sometimes they do. <laughs> I'll take some of the credit, but I'll also say, you know, I'd love for you to go and say this to whoever uh, was the referral, because I'll say yeah. without them, this wouldn't have happened. Uh, you know, I, I helped them. I helped them like go back to the cause and effect. And they said, that's great that you give me some credit, although you did all the work, but it's great that you give me some credit, but think about it without this person putting us in contact, this is not happening. So, right. so it'd be great. I, I think they'd love to hear from you what has happened thanks to them. And so I make the client go back to the referral as well to send them some love and to, to show them that, because it's true, right? People like making a difference and why yes. not, why not share more appreciation? all around. Right. Encouraging them to deepen that relationship with their friend or, or you know, or yeah. colleague. But also it, what it strikes me as is, is kind of a really authentic connection to this concept of gratitude or, or yeah. appreciation, you know, that, you know, Hey, you are here. They did this thing, but also you, you know, they gave you a recommendation and you were, were the one who took it. So go back and appreciate that moment of opportunity that you saw that you took, appreciate the, you know, the person who provided that opportunity. I think that's beautiful. And also, you know, obviously it's great what, to have uh, something to work for you. Yeah. What I'll just say, Mark, on top of that is if you say what I love from this book is if you say thank you once, it looks like it's kind of about the money. It's like, well, thanks for sending me business. Mm -hmm. But if, so that's the first time. But if you say it like multiple times and you keep saying it later down the line, always always in a genuine way, you have no guarantee that there will ever be more referrals from that person, right? You're just doing it based on trust and gratitude and, and genuine, but without asking, oh, could I have more referrals, please? Right. And so I think that all of these subsequent thank yous are much more about the real appreciation and gratitude for making that difference instead of just for, you know, sending money to my bank account indirectly. Right. And I think people yeah. feel that. So if you just say it once, they kind of can tell a bit that it's not they well, feel hundred percent great about yes, it. Thank you. You did a thing. Thank you. But uh in in even, you know, I'll say even if I've you know I've had referrals that I've explored with someone and we chose not to work together and I'll write back and say, hey, you know, we decided that it wasn't the right time or whatever reason, but I still wanted to say how much I appreciate. And then you know the thing about referrals, I just was talking to a friend who referred uh, a new client. And the thing about referrals is, you know, it's a lot different than just like, hey, you know, you know, I, I, I got this great notebook and it's a really good deal. Like, go, you know, go get this notebook. I mean, mm -hmm. you don't like that $8 notebook, like, Oh, you know, okay. Like we're not, we're still friends and you know, it's okay. But if I refer someone to you, for example, you know, I'm, I'm kind of putting my name on the whole experience. Yeah. You know, and so I'm I'm really putting a lot of trust and my reputation in your hands. So what I hear you saying also is like, you know, you're you're going back to that person and you're you're offering them that reassurance, like, hey, that was a good move on your part. You can trust this process. I'm gonna keep you updated so you're not like totally in the dark about whether or not I'm, you know, besmirching your reputation all over the place. There was something we were talking about just before the call that I wanted to kind of touch on. You, you know, I know that you work with um, a lot of corporate clients, small businesses, medium sized businesses, a lot with leadership. I'm curious because I love I love getting to kind of nuggets on this show. Like what's you know, what's what's something that somebody can kind of take away? What would you say is, you know, a common issue that you see in small, medium sized businesses in leadership? Well, there's something that shows up. I mean, there are several things that come up, but the one we we, we started touching upon was the, how can I say this? It's not quite the gap. Well, the gap, let's say the gap between what people think and say they value or they find mm. valuable or they, or they, in a way they want, right? It could be more relationship, intimate relationship, could be more money, uh, could be higher performance from one of their team members, whatever, and what they actually value. And by actually, I mean the root of the word actually meaning in action, mm. what they value. So what I mean by that is, I'll give you a silly example, but it does play out in leadership, although the example I'm going to share with you isn't. If someone says they value financial independence and they don't save and invest anything from what they earn, I'll challenge that. I'll say I think there is like a fundamental incongruence there. You say you value one thing, but you don't take the actions that would reveal that subconsciously and through your actions, you do value it. If you value if you really value financial independence, the people who really do, they're the people who keep building it every time they get money coming in. Right. They will invest in their financial independence. If you're just trying to earn as much as you can, but every time you earn, you just you know spend it. And let's say you invest in courses. I'll be like, okay, well, whatever the courses are, 
that's what you value. Mm, you mm -hmm. might say you want to earn more money and, and, and value financial independence, but if you invest in yoga retreats and spiritual retreats, well, you value yoga and spirituality. At least you value it way more than you do financial independence. And so helping, helping leaders, anyone, but in particular in my work, leaders first like become more self-aware of how congruent they are. Do they actually value what they say they value or is there like a split and mm. where does it show up? That's the first thing. And then applying it to the people that work for them. Because in teams, I had a, a guy in venture capital who wanted someone in his team, so a client who wanted someone in his team to basically just work harder. He felt like she wasn't putting in the effort that the job requires and, and he was thinking about ways to make it happen. And when I was discussing with him, it looked like her behavior clearly showed that she didn't value the, the job of investor, valued her family and her health higher. It's not like there's a right or wrong or, you know, good or bad. It's just people value different things. And just looking at her behavior, she might say she wants to be an investor. She might say she wants to become like a principal or whatever, but her behavior is showing that there's other things that she wants more and she's mm. not owning that. And so trying to, trying to help her get something she says she wants when fundamentally her behavior is like turning the other way, there's, there's first a layer of self-awareness and, and ownership to acknowledge before we try to make any changes. And I think that's something that all of us can look in the mirror quite often more than we do and think, well, hang on, like, are my actions actually demonstrating that I value in my life what I say I value, that I spend time and energy on the things that are important to me, or, or are there two different things? Interesting, that, yeah. would, that would solve a few problems if you could reconcile that. Yeah, I think that's one of the things, and it's kind of hard to do sometimes when you're talking to somebody to sort of find that gap. Cause you know, I'm not sitting next to them all day at the office saying, oh, you're doing all, so you have to create a space where they feel like they can really be transparent and honest about their behaviors. Whereas, you know, I, a lot of times yeah. we'll sort of make excuses or say, yeah, no, I think I'm doing all the, you know, I think I'm doing all the right things. And you kind of see like, you know, but you can't, you can't, you can't call them on yeah. it if they're, not, if they're not sharing that. I mean, what would you recommend, you know, that's one of the trickiest things, I think, especially in well, in, in, any, in any organization is, you know, first of all, getting aligned on on a vision, on values so that everyone feels, you know, a sense of ownership and accountability and, you know, and motivation, frankly, to, you know, to put in the time, put in the work that they need to do. But in a scenario like that, if, you know, if, if a leader is, you know, has gotten clear on the value, you know, whatever the values are for, you know, for themselves and for the organization. And then, of course, the hard thing is when you discover that, you know, the world around you isn't quite as aligned with you as, mm -hmm. as you had hoped. Or, you know, the way I think about it is like this, this article I wrote called The Puzzle of You. It's like, you know, if you, if you, if you're a shape, if your identity and the way you behave and your actions is all kind of like a shape and you realize that you want to change that shape, you know, new actions, more aligned, you know, whatever, you, there's pieces that you've fit around you, people and business and all these other things. And if you change your shape, they also have to accommodate that shape or also, you know, also change their shape to sort of be more aligned with who you want to be. But it sounds like in this case, you know, you might have an employee or even a boss who's not aligned, you know, with with that identity that you're living into. So in this particular example, you know, what would you recommend that, you know, leadership do if they realize, OK, we've, we've, we're really clear on our values now. We're clear on what our expectations are. And, you know, they're not being met by the current way that we're operating or, or even just this current, you mm -hmm. know, on the staff, their behavior. How does one then approach that? Obviously, you know, if you're in the room, you can have these conversations, you can facilitate these conversations. But a lot of times I know, you know, people go back to the office and have to figure this out themselves. So what, what are some of the things that people do in this scenario to, to make it sure everything is now aligned with this new vision of who they are? Well, I think I got your question, but it froze for a second. I come at it from the perspective of for every individual, including this person who's say not fully aligned and underperforming, I want to come at it from the place of like, what's and the mm. empowered path is one of two ways, usually either if she becomes aware of what she values truly, there's one of two choices, either she decides to acknowledge what she does value currently, which is say health, family, and so on. And then she chooses to do that. And so, for example, leave her job as a VC investor, you know, and find something that's a lot more congruent with that life. So basically, it's love what you're currently doing, choose to love what you're currently doing, which is trying to prioritize family and health and so on, or go and do what you love. If you're saying you really want to be an investor, then align your behaviors to the requirements, the expectations, the needs of that path. And mm -hmm. that might mean sacrificing a bit more some other values, right, that 
that you will deprioritize. So my sense is that this is one of two ways. You either love what you do or you go and do what you love. I learned this from like my previous mentor. I think it's a, it's a Gal Stiglitz. Um, and I think it's a, it's a very simple binary choice of empowerment. Mm. Anything in between, and we often find ourselves in between, is not wrong. It's just a more disempowered version of you where you're, you're in one place and you're wishing for something else. It's like the grass is greener somewhere else and it's not you at your, at your best. So now I come from this place and I'm coaching my client, helping him think through how can he help that person make that choice mm -hmm, with, mm -hmm. with, you know, with respect and dignity, but how can he help her instead of like pushing her out or forcing her to improve? How can he lay out the conditions for her to become self-aware that she's got this choice and which one would be most authentic for her? Because we don't know, we can't choose that for the person. So that might require, first of all, his work being like super clear, what are the expectations really of the role? and the company and often these are not properly communicated. Mm -hmm. Often, like my client was a bit disgruntled with her performance, but when we dug into it, the company had never been really clear mm. how high the standards were. So I'm like, well, now you're being unfair, right? You're, you're pissed off at something that <laughs> she was never even given the, the, the real standards to hit. So right. now she's not hitting them, but she doesn't know that that's the target. Like not really, it's all a bit fuzzy. Right. So I think one of the things you can do is be really clear with people already from the hiring process saying, look, in this place, this is what will be needed. This is what will be required. This is what's going to be hard. Yeah. I'm not saying put people off, but almost because that will help them filter and decide, you know what? I don't want yeah. that life well, or I, or I, I do. I, I hear you saying that. And, and, and the thing that I'm kind of hearing underneath that is also that is, I, and this is, I love this idea around leadership is that leadership is really, if you're, if you're effectively leading, then you are creating other leaders, even if that's, you know, creating a sense of self leadership. And that's kind of what you're, you know, I hear you saying that, like to go to somebody and say, Hey, you know what? We realize we haven't communicated this clearly now. And, and so I'm going to tell you what, what we really, really need in, in this role. But I also, you know, I want to support you in getting what you need in your life. So I'm going to tell you that and I'm going to give you, you know, you the choice. You know, there's a, there's a line that I, I've been seeing a lot recently from Adam Grant. They did all this research and, and I forget exactly what the phrase was, but it's one of those like, these 19 words will change your, you know, kind of thing. But it was powerful. You know, he says, you know, if you go to somebody and I forget what the context was, but it works in business. I've got two kids. It, it absolutely is crazy how well it works with kids. But to just say, listen, I've got... I, I'm going to have this conversation with you and my expectations are high for you. And that's because I believe that you can meet them. So now the choice is yours. You know, do you want to step into that? In, you want to step into that role, which I believe you can do, and I will support you in doing it, whether that's getting you more training or, you know, or, or getting you whatever support you need. Or if there's another thing that, you know, that if you're choosing not to do this, how can I support you in getting into a role that's more mm. effective so that we can also have what we need in this role if, if it's not, yes. you know, if it's not for you. But I like that, you know, it's it's an incredibly, in a way, it's also quite vulnerable because you're having this conversation where the other person could say, you know what, it's not for me. And then... Exactly. Yeah. You take the risk of, of exposing because you're more clear. So instead of hoping or expecting that the person will by themselves be like a top performer and intuitively just get it, Right. You have to be really clear about what you what you want, and that has a cost. And basically, you're asking the person, are you someone who wants to make that choice? And maybe you're not. And if you're not, that's okay, right? I respect that. And if you are, maybe you need a bit of help and coaching and mentoring to get there, but at least you will have made that choice. And of course, if they choose and they still fail, at some point, the company can decide to say, well, look, we, we tried, but clearly you're missing like some pieces that we just can't impart to you and, and you know, Fair enough, that can be the outcome too. But I think a lot of the work was put on how can you improve the 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 requests, the demands, the expectations of the company on all these different projects. How exactly would you like them to be delivered? And make that clear. And without don't make it judgmental. It's not mm. like don't judge the mm. person. They just have different values to you. It could fit if they choose. It could not fit. So it's not a question of like they are less a lesser person. It's just they have different values. And they, and often we don't even know it. So we don't even know what really our values are because we're comparing ourselves to everybody else. We're being influenced. We have this clash between what we think we should value and what we actually do. And so all of us, the self-awareness of that is quite difficult to come by. You know, you could do personal work, of course, but it, but still it's a never ending process of refining who am I? What do I care about actually? And then accepting the trade-offs because when you own who you are and you live by it, you know that you're cutting yourself off from a lot of 
other lives that other people are living. And mm -hmm. Sometimes some things look good and you're like, oh, I'd like to have yeah. this, but actually I don't want the full package that comes with it. So right. I'll just let it, I'll just let it go. Or, you know, uh, one of the questions I, you know, I, I'm a very creative person. I, I see possibility, you know, so when opportunities come, I get very, you know, whatever they are, I get excited. So I'm like, oh, this would be really cool. The question that I have to ask myself and that, you know, maybe this employee would want to ask is like, are you excited for this vision to come to life? Probably yes. You know, that's, that's exciting just to think about. Okay. So here's the things that are required to make that happen. Would doing that every day, you know, excite you? There's, there's, there's a great quote by David Bowie. <laughs> He says, you know, you might think that it's it's pretty great to be, you know, uh, an, an international rock star married to a supermodel. And, you know, you'd be right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I think about that. I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, there's there's a life I'd like to live. Do I want to do all the things that, you know, he had to do to that? Mm, that, that doesn't sound quite as exciting. I want to live by some of those values in my own way. But to do that. No, and that's what we have. We have the society where we have all these, you know, people, whether it's, you know, famous coaches or famous artists or, you know, big business people saying, oh, like, I want that. But what you don't see is the expectations and, and the and the work that, that had to go in. Yeah. The you know, to get there. Yeah, to live those values. So, so the you know, the question for me is like, how, you know, how does someone do what they love or love what they do, you know, when that vision isn't quite, you know, fully realized, there's, there's that yeah. whole, you know, there's that whole road, you know, that you have to walk or run or crawl <laughs> yeah it's a pro it's a process i say it like that it sounds like it's a quick flip of a switch but you know it's obviously not and figuring out what you love is a is a long process and not easy and every every step along the way we're we're like the hero's journey right we're we're challenged mm -hmm. and we're tempted to come off the path and because it's scary if you if you truly follow what you what you love what you would love to do i'm speaking here more in a in a vocational context um so mm -hmm. a profession that's really meaningful to you, you'll have like a hundred thousand opportunities to quit because yeah. so many people around, even though well-meaning, will will not be necessarily allies or not exactly in the way that you'd hope. And so there will be your self-doubt, there will be their doubt, there would be the moments where it's not working. There'll just be constant possibilities to exit that. So it's it's a long process. It's not that easy. But I, I mentioned both because I think both can be profound. You have people who choose to love what they do currently, not strive uh, for something else than who they already are and find a lot of grace and life satisfaction in that. Mm -hmm. And you have others who, who, you know, take the bull by the horn and decide to go and do what they love and, and, and fight for it for a long time and two different adventures. I think both yeah. are profound for, for personal growth and we can't choose for someone else, but I think right. anything else than one of these directions is basically you, you choosing the disempowered path. That's beautiful. Choosing the disempowered path. That's a power. That's a um, confronting thing to say in the mirror. You know, I, the last thing I'll say is that, you know, what, what I'm hearing with, you know, the, the love, what you do, you know, I see this a lot, especially with people who maybe have a, a passion or something that they don't want to turn into their vocation, whether it's, you know, something creative or, you know, like I, I love to train you jiu-jitsu um i don't think that i want to make that my profession for various reasons um i think i'm too old to make that my profession at this point um but the fact is you know you can love what you do as part of a larger vision right like i can i can do a thing that you know serves a purpose um when we when we had our first kid actually we we had a lot of expenses and and this big you know this big expense coming and kind of you know freaked out and i did i went i, I went and got like a i went and got a temp job and the job i i could describe it but it was um I was I was intensely overqualified for this job, you know, and I and I went into the interview and the um, the, the the manager, the final guy to come in and sort of talk to me, he sits down and just very matter of fact, he says, you know, it's nice to meet you. But like, why are you here? Like, you're you're just like this scene. Like, why? Why do you want this job? And and, and the funny thing is, I was, I was like, well, can I be honest? I said, I, you know, I, I want a job that I don't actually have to think that hard about. I'm going to I'm going to do this kind of in my sleep. I'm going to be a great employee. I'm going to do everything you ask. I can do other things. I'm happy to jump in never going to complain because it's for this other purpose you know it's for it's for this purpose of supporting my family of supporting my creative thing and that's another interesting way to sort of you know go in with you know yeah. maybe with an employee like this to say i know you have these other things is it possible to step up in this way in service of you having can we find that balance i think what you described there is, is exactly an example of an empowered approach to it i'm not saying everybody should live a life where they love what they do all the time you know that, that 
yeah. their, their job is their passion. No, but you're in this role and you are in my book loving what you do because you're doing it for the sake of your child. One of the, one of the favorite you know? work experiences I've ever had. <laughs> And you're, and you're honest about it. You're not there <laughs> complaining that you have to do this for the sake of, you know, uh, financing your family or which again would be you're just doing exactly the same everyday life, but your experience of it is so much more disempowered and, and incongruent, whereas yours was very much clean and, and aligned. And uh, there was one one final thing I wanted to, to say. Ah, yes. The, the, the last piece I want to share on this is, for example, your jujitsu. All I'm saying to people when I when, when they want to make that choice, all I'm saying is just be fair to yourself manage your expectations because what people do and is like oh, i don't want to be you know a professional jujitsu uh, fighter but they look at the professional jujitsu fighters and right. then they they're disappointed in themselves for not like being there or doing the things that these guys do and, and i'm like now now you're just being unfair to yourself you want to do these two <laughs> separate things and then you compare it to the number one in the world that only do one of them and you feel like a failure towards them. And then you compare it to the number ones in the world on the other thing and you feel like a failure compared to them. <laughs> Right. Like, that's not that's not fair like just if you choose to do multiple things again embrace it that's that's what you chose and you're not going to be michael phelps or hussein bolt or whoever in any yeah. one of them because it's not possible compared to the people who chose you know one thing and one thing fully so it's more about embracing the package and then managing your expectations about this then you can have a wonderful life that's amazing i, I kind of want to close things there it's a great place to stop but you know ben if people are listening and they're curious about what you do where where can they find you? Email create at bendepress.com or on my website, which is www.big-coaching.com. Big B-I-G-coaching.com. Awesome. They can find me on LinkedIn as well, Benjamin Depraz or Ben Depraz. Great. We'll put all those links in the show notes so if people are listening, they can find them there. If you're watching on YouTube or listening on Spotify or Apple or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Uh, ben, I want to thank you again for your time today. I really appreciate uh, making the space more. for this. And what a great conversation. I can't wait to release this one. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. What a great conversation. I love what Ben had to say about finding that gap between your values and your action. It's such a hard thing to do and it's such a wonderful thing to do with clients. So I wanted to say at the end of this, we are just getting started with this podcast and we love offering all of these tools and insights to help you grow. And so I would love to ask if you would help us grow. Yes, like and follow and do those things. But the best thing you can do is share these episodes with your friends. Encourage your friends to listen. Encourage them to send in their own ideas. We'd love to get more content out there that really serves you and what it is that you want. So like, follow and definitely share. And if you're on, you know, wherever you listen to podcasts, you can listen to it. You are on YouTube. And I look forward to seeing you next week with our next guest. Thanks for listening.